Erev Tov, good evening. My name is Lowell Joseph Gallen, founder of the Root and Branch Association Limited. I would like to welcome our viewers and listeners worldwide and our live Zoom studio audience to this evening's program in our Root and Branch Association Limited English Language Conference and Lecture Series broadcasting from Jerusalem, Israel. And now celebrating our first quarter century, our first 25 years since we began in January 1995 until now in August 2020. Today is Monday, August 10th, 2020 in the Gregorian calendar and the 21st day of Av 5780 in the Israelite Hebrew calendar. We are broadcasting from the land of Israel, city of God, Jerusalem, hill of the priests, Kibat Kanania, Abu Tor, overlooking Mount Moriah, where the third and final Israelite temple of Jerusalem will soon be under reconstruction as per Prophet Ezekiel's vision in chapters 40 through 48. Our speaker for this evening's program is Rabbi Professor Hillel Weiss, Chairman Emeritus and founder of the Department of the Languages of the Jewish People at Barlan University in Ramat Gan, Israel. The subject for Rabbi Professor Weiss's talk this evening is Aaron Appelfeld, a great Jewish writer in the state of Israel. And now I would like to welcome our program chair, Dr. Les Glassman, who will introduce Rabbi Professor Weiss. Thank you, Lau. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here this evening. And uh, I want to um, thank you, Professor Rabbi Hilal Weiss, for, um, for your delivery that you're going to be giving us on um, on the Aaron Appelfeld. Um, just wishing you all a Shavuot Tov. And uh, we really look forward to, to you know, Prof, what you're going to be um, discussing and you'll be uh, illuminating the life of um, Aaron Appelfeld. Um, if we could ask um, the listeners and the viewers, if we could maybe have the questions at the end of your presentation, um, Prof, would you prefer, or during the during your talk, um, uh, Professor Hilal, would you prefer uh, if we have yes. questions mm -hmm. that you have at the end of the talk or uh, during the talk? If someone has a question to ask, can I start? May I start? Do you hear me? Okay. Um, so you don't mind if people do, hopefully do will you ask me? questions after. Do okay. So I think that's what we're going to do. If we have questions, if you can hold it till after your, your presentation. So we look forward to your, your address this evening. And I want to thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you all for organizing this lovely event this evening. Prof, if you can begin. The floor is yours. Okay, Prof, we can start. go ahead. To speak yeah. about, we, we, we will start to speak about the great Jewish writer Aaron Appelfeld, who passed away three years ago on uh, age 85. He was born in uh, Romania um, on 32, and uh, as you understand, he was seven years old. Uh, when the Holocaust started and uh, he was neglected as a child, as a young child in the wilderness, in the forest. His mother was murdered uh, at the beginning uh, when he was seven years old and his uh, father um, have to leave him in this uh, awful time and he was raised, let's say, 
by himself, by the animals, by the trees in the forest, by young children, and by, by all kinds of uh, horrible monsters, and also tzaddikim, then that he met through his uh, all experience in the Holocaust. But as he said, I, let's say, I remember nothing. All my memory has been deleted. And all what I try to write comes from very uh, deep feelings, but not from me memories. And uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, very heavy uh, start point uh, give him the uniqueness of his uh, of his literature, his truth, his uh, being a unique uh, author in the entire Jewish world that um, deliver the deep message of the destruction and also the chance of redemption through his 40 novels or books that he wrote that are a, com a complex of short stories, novels and uh, long novels and so on. But all of these have roots that are very simple and are very basic um, principles that if one read this, he has the keys to his entire uh, complete works. I am turning you to his work, uh, The Story of Life, Sipur Chaim, uh, which was uh, published on uh, in, uh, 199 and was translated to English. Now, this, uh, let's say, memories or visions or feelings without memory is the key to his entire work and uh, it makes it very easy uh, to understand very deep um, constructions, feelings, and um, unique abilities uh, to make a very deep connection with, let's say, this human being from the entire uh, uh, cultures, humanities, not only Jews, but anybody that have the same fears, the same uh, anxious, the same uh, uh, fear of a catastrophe that can be inflict any day on the entire uh, humanity, like now with the corona, or the fear of uh, mass destruction and so on, give he uh, amplified, give tools uh, to the, let's say, to the more strong, the more pure, the more simple people like uh, tzaddikim, right persons in the Hasidic uh, uh, compiled works that uh, Appelfeld felt intuitively that he's related to them by his uh, grandfather and grandmother uh, more than uh, his parents. He, he loved his parents very much. He loved his mother, he loved his father, he was very devoted to them, he hoped all the Holocaust to come back home. Both of them were uh, intellectual, they were 
communists, they were atheists, they spoke against uh, God, against the belief, like any profound communist, but on the background, there was the grandfather and the grandmother uh, that they have been uh, um, in the high uh, mountains, in the fogs, and he, let's say in most of his uh, works, he tries to, to hold connections that is very, let's say, mystics, but without speaking too much on uh, Kabbalah, and even on Hasidut, always the rule is to simplify, to simplify the visions, to simplify the, the, the feelings, not to be, never to be intellectual, never to speak um, uh, let's say uh, abstract, the, the, the real uh, experience in the field, in the forest, with the animals, with the stones, with the cold, with the, fo with the frost, and with the stars in the sky, and the strange people that he met in his uh, adventure, till he, he, the Holocaust have been finished, and he was saved, and he spent about uh, two years on the coast of Italy, on the coast of Yugoslavia, with many refugees, uh, many people that were corrupted, were thieves, uh, were all kind of twisted people, but he was saved and uh, come uh, to Israel uh, on the 46, when he was about 15 years old, and uh, he learned the uh, uh, agriculture by some agricultural school, and then he was, uh, he joined the Israeli Young Army. This was a very hard uh, experience to him, for, for many reasons. Uh, he felt all his life as a stranger, as an alien. He never felt as one of the group, not of the Tzabarim, not of the Israelis born, and not of the uh, ref young uh, refugees. All his life, he felt that he is something uh, separate something, uh, let's say, out of order, that he has to build his own, his, his uh, entire um, uh, focus uh, by himself. Uh, and this is a very, very uh, deep story, uh, how he was raised from the garbage, uh, to become a very uh, evaluated uh, author that he got many prizes, also Pras Israel, the prize of the State of Israel on 83. But beside of this, he got uh, um, any prizes that one uh, can imagine, uh, let's say beside the Nobel Prize, but he got uh, also many uh, prizes from, uh, from, from French and uh, many other lands that appreciated his works. It was translated uh, to many languages. Now there are researchers like Igal Schwartz that was also his uh, editor on many books that wrote on him at least four books as a researcher. And uh, in each university, 
you can find uh, professionals that deals with the, the work of uh, Appelfeld. In my university before a few years, uh, there was a book, uh, edited a book by Avid Oblipsker and Avi Sagi, 24, 24 uh, readings in the works of Appelfeld. And I've, I've also, I've also a, an article and research in this book, and I want to speak something about uh, this. Uh, the main uh, article is on the book. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called The Azam Odlo Nadam, and the rage is not yet over. This is the translation of uh, the title. And uh, this uh, novel uh, was uh, published on 208. It's one of, let's say, the five or six last works of uh, Appelfeld that mostly he published uh, a book in a year or a book in a two years. As we said uh, before, there are 40 books. He started to publish in the early 60s. Uh, his first book, uh, works were poems, uh, but he published short stories. Uh, but as a, a compiled short stories, it came uh, books like Ashan, and uh, some others in the early 60s. Uh, so he succeeded to publish uh, those many books, uh, like a fountain uh, that never stops uh, to write for a moment. And this is also is a great riddle that uh, Appelfeld uh, uh, overturn his stories, tries to read them, uh, to write them again and again, or there is a renew and fresh freshness in his trips, in his voyage, in his stories, the stories that uh, the background is his childhood, uh, before the Shoah, before the Holocaust, the stories that belong to the Holocaust and the stories, I make it very simple, that they wrote on the background of uh, Eretz Israel and Israel, on the refugees and his, uh, all his adventures that have been in the university. He, his teachers, uh, that he a, a very highly uh, respectfully, uh, full with uh, respect to them, uh, like Gershom Sholem, uh, like uh, Buber, and uh, like Cheskel Kaufman. Uh, he speaks on those professors, like that he describes his speaks and write about uh, Agnon, about Uri Zvi Greenberg, and here and there, he speaks on the sabra writers like uh, Shamir, and Nizar, and Chaim Guri. Uh, so in his uh, loneliness, in his isolation, he was connected very deeply to the Jewish and Israeli culture that was raised after uh, the Holocaust, and he analyzed it very deeply in his essays and in his uh, novels. Now, as I said before, I want to speak on this uh, novel, uh, and the rage is not yet over. Uh, this uh, novel, uh, the main uh, hero is uh, at the beginning a child 
His name is uh, Bruno Bromart. That his hand has been amputated when he was four years old. Uh, but this uh, uh, this uh, situation makes him uh, much much more stronger than anyone else. Give him a lot of success in his life and explain why he became in his eyes a son of a king, a prince. The motive, the main motive of the, this story and some others is that the Jews, they are uh, princes, they are the sons of Bnei Melachim, they are, they are the sons of the kings. And uh, this feeling was installed in his soul, in soul, first of all, by a Christian priest. Uh, that uh, he is one of the heroes uh, of the story. And like in many other stories, like uh, Katerina and many other stories, uh, the religious Christian give the Jews uh, the power to feel their uniqueness and their mission in, in their life. Um, I will try to start uh, to translate some of the things that I wrote. The headline is The Son of the King and the Pauper. The, between Appelfeld and Agnon, according the, especially in the novel, uh, and the rage is not yet over, and the novel of Agnon, Oreach uh, Natal uh, Alon, um, a guest uh, for, uh, let's say, for one night, which is a very famous novel of Agnon, but I'm not going to speak today. Uh, I'm quite not going to speak on Agnon, on this evening, I am on this lecture. I am going to speak uh, only on uh, Appelfeld. Appelfeld have the urge, the everlasting urge, to decode the secret of the uniqueness of the Jew from his divine souls, like the, uh, the priest, uh, or let's say, uh, Teresa teaches the young girl, Helga, that she is uh, born to a Jewish mother and to a German father in the book, Chaim uh, Shneimim, uh, entire life that was published uh, on uh, 2007. Uh, then the priest that teaches, uh, the priest Peter that teaches uh, the young guy Bruno Bromart explains him that uh, to contemplate and listen brings us very near to the inner secret. The secret doesn't like when you enforce him to get out from his garments, from his wraps. Then I ask, the evil people also have a secret? I asked and he said, the evil have no secret. They have a plot. So I ask, how we shall know what is a secret and what is a plot? And he answered, the 
secret is a present from God. It is light. And the plot is darkness. It's only the evil of the human being. Now, in all this uh, work and other works, Appelfeld want to explain what is the chosenness, the uniqueness of the nation of Israel. Many people today think that it is racism. They are ashamed with it. But what we see in the BLM, in the Black Lives Matters, and in the white universities in the United States, that the racism is there, and not in the Jewish people, and not in the Torah, all the mercy, all the partnership with all the human beings, this is the one source of all the human being from the first Adam, from the sons of Noah, is coming from the Bible, from exegesis, from the story of the creation. And in the world of Appelfeld, he is also a chosen Jew from his brother. He is like Joseph and his brother. The brothers are simple people. They are shepherds. And Joseph is a king. And his dream is that his father and mother and brother are born to him. And this makes the brothers crazy. They are selling him to the Egyptians, and everyone knows these stories. And the Joseph is becoming a pauper. He's becoming in jail as a slave. And uh, because of his talent, and because Hashem guarded him, and so on, he was saved from the dungeon, like Appelfeld from the Holocaust and from his uh, ignorance, or let's say from his, he was uneducated. He was educated during the Shoah by all kinds of persons, like this uh, priest uh, Peter, and so on. And in this uh, work, uh, and the rage is not yet over, we can follow uh, this uh, process. Now, any any son of a king has the opposite. Like the story of the Mark Twain uh, and the many other stories, uh, like of uh, Rabbi Nachman, and many, many other stories. It's a very famous motif. Also on uh, Solomon the king, that the Satan uh, took, throw him out from his chair, and uh, Solomon became a pauper, and the uh, Satan sat on his uh, chair till the order become back uh, to the world. Now, this uh, Bruno, Bruno Romart is a very, very talented guy, and he succeeded uh, to overpass uh, the Holocaust. He had the, uh, he was connected to three unique friends, like in the legends of the Grimm story, each of those uh, guys had a unique talent. Uh, one was uh, deaf and uh, dumb, one only knew to pray, and one slept most of the time. Now with these so, uh, three guys, he succeeded to 
ran away from a concentration camp that was burned, was built by the Jews, and when he has to be activated, an engineer uh, caused the, a great fire, they destroy all this uh, uh, camp, and those uh, four guys ran away uh, in the middle of the winter uh, to the forest, after a chase of uh, dogs and uh, uh, many Ukrainians and Nazis and so on, uh, but they succeeded to pass all the horrible winters till they were saved uh, in the end uh, of the Holocaust by the Soviet army and uh, others that uh, by all kind of uh, adventures and miracles uh, saved them from uh, their horrible situation. And I'm not uh, going now to, to go to details. Uh, now, this uh, Bruno Bromar, immediately after the Holocaust, succeeded to build an empire of uh, merchandise uh, all over uh, Europe, and his friends ran away from him because he became alien, he became a stranger uh, to them. Uh, it, 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 they didn't understand how such a guy that was, was the son of a communist uh, became uh, became a, a, such a, a big uh, a, a bourgeois, a, a big, uh, how you say it, uh, like uh, Trump or like many Jews that succeeded uh, to make a, a great economic after the Holocaust, some of them are very famous here in Israel and uh, in the entire world, uh, like Soros. But uh, I don't want to say that only people that are under critique uh, succeeded to build empires. Many rabbis, real rabbis, Hasidim, in Borough Park, in New York, uh, uh, without uh, being jealous, uh, succeeded uh, to build uh, big communities of more than 100,000 uh, uh, people or Hasidim. I'm not speaking only on one or two. And this uh, many times raised the uh, anti-Semitism, and so on, because of this talent. And this uh, Bruno Bromar has this special talent, let's say like Joseph in Egypt, that raised the entire economic of Paro and raised the Egypt from the famine. And let's say that this uh, Bruno is making by himself, but also with great idea, a messianic idea, uh, to cure the refugees, to cure the Jews, and to making them again uh, the sons of the king. Every Jew, by potential, as it's written in the Gemara, Call Israel and Bnei Melachim, and this is also have some meaning in the halacha, uh, that one have to respect himself and to behave like a prince by speaking, by his garments, by his relation to people, by his self-respect, and by also by doing mercy and so on. 
this uh, Omar uh, raised with some very talent, talented people an institution in Italy, a palace, a big, big palace. Uh, he hired uh, compositors, uh, all kind of uh, people that knew to play on uh, very talented people to make a concert, even uh, not only a camera, but also a symphonic uh, concerts. And he also hired an actor who knew to read the Bible very, very excitingly. And he tried to cure the Jews and anyone that came to this palace. He didn't ask someone is a Jew or not, uh, by changing their uh, personality and behavior uh, with these uh, concerts and with this reading of the Bible. But this was uh, some uh, also uh, naive illusions. Even some uh, people have been uh, uh, attracted uh, you know, to this concert, this uh, uh, producing and events and so on, uh, many people suspected uh, Bruno Bomar that he is stealing the money, that the money is coming not from uh, uh, pure sources, that he is a sieve, that the money belongs to them, and he is, is stealing the money of the refugees. And he was always under horrible critics that uh, has been a great threat on his business and on his uh, uh, great uh, uh, achievement with this, uh, with this palace and so on. During the time, uh, his uh, business, uh, let's say, collapsed, and he, some of his friends uh, make suicide, take their lives. Some of his friends ran away, vanished, and he, let's say, wasn't forced uh, to make aliyah, and he didn't want to come to Jerusalem, was very afraid. He tried all to stay only in Tel Aviv. He was afraid that he will uh, face the reality. There is, that there is no holiness, there is no temple, there is no Judaism, that most of them are assimilated, that, uh, that they are enemies of the sources, uh, that they want to be uh, only Israelis, very superficial Israelis, and so on. Then he preferred uh, to stay in uh, Tel Aviv and to make, let's say, a caricature of his previous life. He bought uh, some house in a street in the center of Tel Aviv that have uh, let's say, two big rooms, two halls, and they put their uh, tables to people that play chess and uh, come uh, to spend their time uh, with coffee and so on, and to cure themselves from the horrible adventures of uh, the Shoah and so on. But this was uh, such a great uh, um, minimizing his uh, big uh, dreams of redemption, the, the messianic uh, dreams, the Joseph dreams, that he, let's say, deteriorated, he collapsed uh, more or less and became uh, old and uh, 
his uh, his uh, missing hand uh, became a burden uh, to him. But when he was in uh, the Holocaust, the missing hand was like antenna. It was uh, like an instrument that uh, that get all the voices from his parents, from his grandparents, from the people that died. He could do with his one hand and two legs much more physically that people could do uh, with, uh, that healthy people could do. In this, uh, this uh, uh, missing was a great blessing uh, for him. Now the idea behind is that if you are an unable, this is a great blessing, especially for a Jew. Like he has a leprosy, like he has a corona, like he has a disease, that from one side is isolated, but from the second side, he become more and more special and unique, and his uh, failure become the key of the secret, the key of the great success. Now, with those visions and those ideas, uh, Appelfeld succeeded to rebuild his personality, his talent, his uniqueness. He didn't lean on any, anybody. He was very much inspired uh, by Kafka and by Agnon and so on, but he was not depend on them. He had also limits and critics for their, uh, their uh, orders and so on. He could, he could define his uniqueness even more or less without those uh, influences. Now, uh, I want uh, to show how the ideas that I spoke upon them now are installed in the chapters and the short stories of the collection that is called The Story of a Light, um, which he, Aberfeld says those pages are chapters of memories and the uh, contemplating. Our memory is uh, very selectively and very dodging, and he only keeps what he likes to keep. He doesn't keep only the good, uh, the memory, like a dream, takes from the very sick stream of uh, personal events, some uh, special uh, selected uh, memories. And from those memories, he built everything uh, in his uh, creation. He said the, the less the ones uses languages using words, the deep, and the better his memory and creation and art is, uh, is originally, is authentic, and so on. And he explains how this process is uh, work, how the oblivion to the forgetting helps to create very fresh uh, stories. And he explains how many years he was 
uh, in the a very deep sleep uh, that you forget everything like his life was only on the surface but it was not it was untrue there was burst it parts of uh, memories uh, like a lava uh, that comes from time to time and those build his uh, uh, creation um, now on chapter one he said when I started to remember, and then he say, maybe at four years old, in our last uh, vacance with my father and mother in the forest of the Carpats in the, the mountains, the, this uh, range in Romania and uh, Slovakia and uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, till Transylvania, uh, those are the big uh, Carpats and the lower Carpats. And the, in the high mountains, uh, there his uh, grandfather and his grandmother lives. And uh, this gives him the great power and the longing for those uh, things that he really doesn't remember too much. No, I am not, uh, he describes his grandmother, he describes his uh, grandfather and so on, but let's say it is uh, invented uh, um, imagination. He says that his uh, father was, his grandfather was very religious. He took him to the synagogue and uh, we see in all those uh, novels, the longing of uh, upper faith to learn to know how to pray, to be a prayer, to be like a big prayer, even he doesn't uh, believe too much in God, he believes in the process of praying. And he tells how one Jew that doesn't believe at all teaches him to pray. And it is a very strange and unique story. And the, in the novel, the main novel that we speak about it, and the rage is not over yet, there is a big uh, prayer. His name is uh, Yosef Chaim that all the Holocaust, he prays in the winter, in the forest, in the concentration camp and so on. And uh, Bruno Bromart or Appelfe is very much attracted uh, to this uh, man that hold the secret. And uh, when this uh, man and the other people that follow the Bromart leave him because of his great business, he had a very strong, uh, he longs very much to those three friends and especially to this uh, big prayer, Yosef Chaim, that he met him again in uh, Eret Israel as a gardener of a, of a orchard, uh, an old gardener, uh, but he, let's say, he uh, he now, um... They have to make their own livings and so on, and uh, uh, to remain. Now, I tried uh, uh, to explain uh, some of the secrets. Uh, um, I uh, want to explain and read some chapter 
of the priest in uh, the Sipur Chaim, which is in uh, chapter 28, in uh, page uh, 156. Uh, and you can uh, find the... Uh, uh, Okay, here it is. I, I will translate it uh, to Hebrew. I acquainted with Mordechai uh, many years ago when I was a teacher in an evening high school. He had a very small shop uh, next to the school in the noon time, he closed it, he prepared the sandwiches and coffee, and we sat uh, next to the window and played chess. Chess was his great uh, last. Like uh, Appelfeld that uh, play chess in uh, coffee houses and smoke, and this wo was all what he did many years in Eretz Israel. He was in my age, and the chess play took many, sometimes two hours, uh, but I take, uh, I put attention to his ways of how he bent his head, like he knew to pray many years ago. Sometimes he shut his eyes, like he asked his uh, thinkings to be, to be very concentrated. His fingers were very long and thin, and uh, they didn't uh, uh, fit his business uh, in this uh, grocery. Um, after many years, he, no, after a year of acquaintance, he told me that between five and nine years old, he was uh, in an abbey, uh, in a minzar, and uh, the pranks, the duty, was also in, at night, in the middle of the night. His parents gave him to this, uh, uh, Abbey, this means Zar, they promised to come back and take him in a few days, but didn't came. He burst in a very long, he wept some days, but the, the priests were him that he will not go on wiping, and then they closed him in a very small room till he didn't have no more power to weep. And when he stopped to weep, the priests opened the small room, gave him a cup of warm milk, and from then on, he never uh, wept anymore. Mordechai doesn't speak too much well. Every word cost him, like cost him blood and money. Uh, if I would uh, take care of him, I didn't ask him, more questions, only stick with him and don't, don't ask any questions anymore. Who was his parents? Why he believes that he will come and take him? Once he told me that the priest George, like in our book, the priest Peter, said in the same words that Peter said, there is not, one is not allowed to fear Fear is only imaginable. Fear makes the monsters. We have to fear only from the Father in the heaven. And the most you are adhesive, you are uh, connected to the Father in heaven, the less is the fear. This helped me a lot. And I quite ask him, but I, uh, succeeded not to ask, uh, uh, is it really? 
no say. It's a fable. It's a forbear. It's like to what? Like our Im imaginable life. And where it is not imaginable, only in God's, where God dwells. He, of course, doesn't keep the Christian uh, ritual and doesn't keep our mitzvahs, but you see in all his existence that there is a religiousness that he bought in the Abbey, in the Minzar. Uh, sometimes I think that he waits to the time that he will be allowed to pray. Um, I asked him, uh, what he, when you pray, what you speak in the, the monastery? Uh, he said, in the monastery, in the Abbey, people doesn't speak. And if you want to speak what you are doing, then you are shutting your eyes and say, Jesus, our master, please save me from the awful uh, feelings and wills and keep me under your wings. Uh, and this helps me. Uh, many times I saw that his real lives are still in the, in the abbey, in the monsters. And all, and all what come after is, is only some diggings. He digs his uh, previous lives, but he keeps them. Uh, and when he speaks on his childhood, he doesn't speak in past. He speaks always in the present. Uh, and therefore, I also feel that someday, I could also pray. The religiousness of Mordechai has a very tough um, land, very strong land. When he said to pray or to make atonement, to make to feast, he speaks from his experience. He doesn't invent stories. He knows what is a pray. He knows what is a feast. Uh, he also told me, that next to the monster, there was a pond, there was a small, a, a tiny river, and in the at summer, he went down and bathed himself. All this, is, he gave me hints, as very real, realistic uh, remembrance. Uh, on 72, he left Jerusalem and settled himself in a Moshav, in an agriculture uh, uh, settlement. I don't know why he left the town. Sometimes I feel that some of his movements, some of his uh, gestures uh, are installed in me. Sometimes I use words that he uses them. This Mordechai never finished high school. He never learned in university. But they learn, they, they learning in the monastery, in the absorb in his soul. Those life uh, pointed him to the most needable, to the needy, and only for the very small uh, things that one needs in his life. And the rule, his rule is less and less speaking. By speaking is hidden the ancient scene. Therefore, don't speak too much. And we can say also, don't write too much. But this is a paradox because the uh, apple faith, as we said, was like a fountain. He wrote those 40 uh, books that never, once that read them, never is bored. He feels, I feel at least, that I'm reading uh, Rabbi Nachman Ibreslav, that I'm reading uh, 
אה, ברמח"ל, זה את ה-in reading חסידיק, uh, very deep, uh, uh, the most deep pure books that Jews ever wrote in their life. So in the 19th century, the most uh, famous uh, author was Mendel Mochostorin. He was called the Jews of Jewishness, the Jews of, the, of all the writers. He was a maske. After, in the 20th century, it was Agnon. But after Agnon, the Jew, the tzaddik, the rebbe, the one that teaches Jews that build the palace, that uh, build the composition of the morals, of the ethics by his word, is the only one, is uh, Aaron Appelfeld. And I think that it, it, this is some uh, preface uh, to understand the uniqueness of uh, Aaron Appelfeld as a Jewish writer, in uh, Eretz Israel, in the state of Israel, with his uh, critics and with his feelings and with his uh, unique uh, tradition that is rebuilt and reinvented from his uh, uh, deep sources uh, that comes from experience and from the vision, from the dreams and the imagination. Let's go and start and re-read Aaron Appelfeld from the beginning uh, to the last. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Wow. Uh, thanks, Prof. Hilal uh, Weiss, this has been an extraordinary presentation. Your expert, your expertise, it was compelling, your insight, really it is something, there are no words, you really spoke incredibly well and we have such a, a wonderful understanding of this, this great author, Israeli and Jewish author. So I want to open up the floor to any questions, if anybody's got any comments or questions to ask um, Rabbi Professor Hilal Weiss, you're welcome. Larry, maybe you want to start uh, with a question or a comment? Yes, I think Larry Pfeffer would like to make a comment. Um, yeah, did you know uh, Aaron Appelfeld? Please repeat yourself if you ask, did you know what? Did you know Aaron with Appelfeld? Larry? I I sat with him twice in a coffee and I make with him interviews uh, from a correction. Yeah. And I meet him in some uh, conferences. Uh, we have, uh, I think, very good and deep feeling to each uh, other. Uh, but Appelfeld respected anybody. Uh, he was very curious. He was very uh, sharp. He knew to listen. Uh, but for your uh, answering, the answer or the small answer is yes. I met uh, uh, Appelfeld a uh, few times in my life, even when I was a student and uh, when I was in the, let's say, in the last 10 years, I met him and also in some uh, conference that I made when I finished my, my job in the university. I was the uh, head of the department of uh, the Center of Yiddish, uh, and we made uh, many times conferences, but it was the last conferences of the um, Jewish uh, literatures uh, all over the world, and especially of uh, Yiddish and Latino and Arabic and so on. And uh, Appelfeld gave gives a lecture, he was very close to Yiddish, 
uh, he liked this uh, language very much. He took the language, the language of his uh, uh, grandfathers. Uh, and uh, this way, look, I learned only Yiddish from my parents, and that I was this, uh, this job, it was very artificial. I'm not a researcher, a researcher of uh, Yiddish uh, literature, uh, but I chased after all the great authors that remain from Russia and Poland, uh, because of my friend, uh, Professor Kotlerman, uh, that was uh, on this time a uh, uh, doctor. And uh, let's say he came uh, from Virobijan and I adapted him to be a professional in Agnon and he adapted me back uh, to the Yiddish world. And uh, therefore, uh, and for some more reasons, uh, we succeeded uh, to make some uh, sync with the authors of the uh, Soviet Union, of Ukraine, uh, uh, let's say state, and Romania, and uh, the Western Yiddish, and so on. And I'm very proud on this uh, uh, time, that I was three years uh, the head of this uh, department. This was an opportunity to meet uh, Appefeld uh, more than in a coffee or to make an in interview or two interviews with him. Uh, when he printed the book, uh, Pauline Eretz Yeruka, Pauline uh, Greenland, and uh, uh, some uh, more books uh, that uh, I followed them on this time. Um, I met him, uh, I think, twice at Bet Ticho in Jerusalem. And my impression was that he's approachable. You know, I think he used to do a lot of writing at Bet Ticho, like some of the European so, so. writers. And uh, he seemed to be a modest man and something very sad about him. That's the impression that I uh, was left with. I, try, I was very touched by his novel, Katerina in another novel, which I forgot. And especially, I think, in the talent for conveying the feeling of being there, you know, the regish, the sentiments. And uh, it's cool. I, and I once told him that it's his cool. books are like a living museum, because you could feel that you are there. We tried to have him nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Uh, I, I was not able to nominate him, but I was in touch with, uh, Somebody knew uh, Kertes from Budapest who got a Nobel Prize, a Jewish author, and somebody else. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. I thought that maybe I was naive. I thought he deserved a Nobel Prize. What do you think? No, oh, no, you are, you are not naive. He it, it, it deserved this prize. He deserved this prize. I also met him in the same uh, Tijo coffee house. He said that always this was his uh, uh, Michelat. This right. was his uh, office. Yes. Sure. This, the, oh, this yeah. was his office. And uh, as you say, he was very humble. Uh, he was very modest. And to write a book on his ethics is a very needy book. You have to decode his ethics by his heroes, by his, uh, how you say today, uh, upper heroes, Giborei Al, right. and he yeah. has in his books like Katerina, uh, dumb people, people that have a very deep feelings, even without speaking, and they reveal the depths of life. Uh, those, um, let's say, very simple, peasant, uh, people that are much more pure uh, and deep than the, any professor. In this uh, book, Sipor Chaim, he speaks how much he suffered from the over-intellectual people uh, and how much he likes 
uh, let's say, academician that were uh, behaved very simply. And so on, you have, uh, then you have connection with them. Okay, that's what I have uh, to say about this. Maybe I'd like to say one more thing. I wrote to you that uh, I used to organize with some friends, uh, including Kilar Cook's daughter, every year a conference, uh, an event called the uh, International Rescue of the, of the day when Wallenberg was abducted, January 17th. And to uh, one of our meetings, uh, Aaron Appelfeld agreed to come and speak to us in Hebrew. And, uh, and I want to relate the story, but he spoke about terrible things that happened to him that he was a witness to as a child. For example, he was working with a prostitute for a long time. And the things that he saw, and he was bringing tea, etc. He, he was involved with robbers who adopted him for a while. He went through terrible experiences. And he came out, I think, as a very pure man and a very nice man. That's my memory of him. So he always had a feeling of blame, self-blame. He admired all the people, uh, like Wallenberg, they gave their life uh, for their uh, mission without making any, any countenance and so on. And also was Appelfeld, but the feeling of the blame, he even uh, tries to make himself dirty uh, to, to win this feeling. He tells in Sipur Chaim that once uh, a Jew in the camp after the Holocaust, his, uh, his watch, of gold uh, was stolen. And he, and he weep and shout and make a great uh, um, sensation and uh, sorrow from this loss. And uh, Appenfeld tells that he steal the watch when he was, uh, let's say, 13 or something like this but he was so much afraid that he buried it in the ground. He dig and uh, covered it and so on, and he didn't took the watch. But we don't know if it is true or not, but we know that the, to find something that you even remain in life, most of the survivors write about it a lot, that succeeded not to be killed, not to be murdered, uh, take with them these uh, feelings, why I succeeded, and my wife, or children, or friends, or people in the, in the, the gulag, in the, uh, they, all of them have been sent to death. And this gives, many times, even in wars, even in, uh, in, in Israel, in the wars, if uh, many people getting killed, like in the Yom Kippur War, there is the story of uh, Sabato and many others, they always tortured themselves. Why didn't I also have been killed? I prefer to be killed, but not take on my back this burden of saving, because there is something unpleasant, unclean in this, uh, that I was saved by this. And Abelfeld told in many stories that many cursed him and blamed him incorrectly. He said, I told you this, uh, Bruno Bromart, uh, people say you steal from the joint, the, uh, this is our money, let's say like with Bibi and so on, you see that if someone is too much successive, over successive, you make crazy uh, all the less successive, and then he take upon himself the blaming, the fault, and the, even he tries to, to stumble himself, to, to make obstacles to himself that he will not succeed anymore. 
is running away from the success. And this is uh, some complex that you can find in uh, Appelfeld stories. And Prof. if I can just ask, uh, how is uh, Aaron Appelfeld's emunah, his belief in Hashem? According with what you yes. know. He, he believes in Hashem, but he doesn't make him reductions. It's, let's say, it's like, uh, it's like Rabbi Leid Yisrael in Berdice, or, or like Abraham, or like Jacob. Mm-hmm. You have always very great critic and questions, and you don't uh, uh, surrender uh, to the superpower to, to the God's uh, ruling of the world because you as a human being that you saw so much suffering, uh, you, you have complained. And it's a le- legitimate in Judaism, like in uh, Hana, Hana, the mother of Samuel, and, and more others like Habakkuk, like uh, Job, and so many. And uh, so it's not to, uh, to make over chutzpah and so on, but um, sometimes you think I will be a believer even without God, because the, the emuna is much more great than the, the source. And uh, up for the was not an Orthodox Jew. He was not a reforming Jew. He was a real Jew. He understood it very, very deeply. And uh, it's also a kind of research, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you can find in the lot of riches that have already done a lot of answers to this uh, uh, question. Uh, but I, as an Orthodox Jew, it is uh, some, I think it's, it's a bit strange that I identified these people like uh, Appelfeld and these people like uh, uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak in Berdichev and others that have this complaint, that have this critic. And now, we were reading on uh, Moses in the Varim when uh, Shem, God doesn't g- allow him to enter to Eret Israel. Mm-hmm. And uh, Moshe doesn't give up. The last word of, is of Hashem, of course. But uh, Moshe needs God to let him enter. And uh, Appelfeld needs Hashem by his work. And this is very, let's say, this is very important point, the critic. Maybe this is a bit like the story, I don't know if it's a Bar Shem story, about the shepherd who came into the synagogue and uh, yes. the prayers were not going very well and started whistling, right? Yeah. And that opened the gates of heaven. That came from the, the heart, from something very pure. Is something like that, you think, with Appelfeld? That's, 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 uh, it's very important that you raise this, uh, um, let's say, footnote, um, that you raised it. Now, this week passed away uh, Rabbi Steinsatz, right. and he was very, very close to this spectrum that you raised now. He was a very sharp guy. He was very weak. He was a genius. But he also had all those uh, feelings and critics and opening the gates uh, to people that are not religious, to people that are not uh, orthodox and so on. Let's say like the Rabbi Milubavich and so on. It's everyone with its own... uh, uh, personality and uh, education, 
but it's very close to, to, to Hasidut. Now, in the postmodern times, people use this, this, uh, this ability, this talent, too much. They, it's over chutzpe. It's over uh, the fields that they have the legitimacy um, uh, to decide uh, for God, uh, to decide what are the laws, what are the values, to fit them to the situation. It became a plug that doesn't come from humbleness, that doesn't come from uh, its sneers, from modesty, and so on. It's come from proud. And as I start to speak, what is the difference between secret and the plot? When it comes from darkness and when it comes from light, and everyone has its limits and feelings when he must stop to speak and to give lectures and to listen to other people and to listen to the ants in the field, to the papers, to the people that have no, uh, no way, no career, no name, no children, no family, that they are neglected and so on. And it's, uh, let's say, by feelings, it's uh, close to the theory of Christianity and so on. There is a, a lines, a line that combines those feelings, but you can find them in Chazal, like in Perkei uh, Avot. The one said, Sheli Shelcha, 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 is a Chosi. It is, gave up everything. It doesn't come from Christianity. It came from these uh, feelings of a, of a Jew, like, like the story of Lebanon. You know, it's written that uh, in, in uh, I think, in, uh, Joshua, when, when came uh, those uh, people that uh, make themselves uh, uh, pure and dull, and they came to Givonim. And they say, we heard that the kings of Israel are merciful kings. And so was Saul the king not only because he betrayed what Shmuel told him, but this was his feelings. And you can find that even uh, Moses, God tell him, go and conquer uh, Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Moses sent him a delegation to speak with him on the conditions of uh, peace. And then in the Chazal, it said, wow, Hashem, God told you to inherit him, to conquer him, and you are sending him a, a, a delegation. And for Moshe, we are learning the law that you cannot start a war without giving a chance to the enemy to, uh, to make according the condition uh, sholem or peace or uh, surrender or something like this. It's a very deep uh, topic that I'm not going to develop it now, but to see that it is rooted in the Torah, in the in Judaism, not only the Amalek and not only the killing the seven nations and so on, but also the Kriti, the opposite like Abraham with the people of Sodom, and uh, like God with the people of Nineveh, and so on. So we see that those uh, feelings are very, very uh, inside, even up until so the most cruel things in life, and he heard from uh, refugees and children that have been uh, beaten and some of them uh, by, by wolf dogs and so on, and uh, the most horrible things that you ever heard in your life, you see that 
some people, few people, few children that succeeded to still be in life, they have been the most uh, great human, human beings that ever have been on earth. Those people, uh, like uh, Jews, like children, like uh, old Christian women, like people in monastery, and so it depends on the man. It doesn't depend so much on his, uh, let's say, religion or background and so on. That's what we see from the stories of Abdelfeld, that he was a hyper good Jew. He was not a reformed Jew, he was not a superficial Jew, he was a very deep, very deep Jew. He was a tzaddik. Well, that's what I have to say. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I think uh, you've answered so brilliantly, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think the hour's late. But uh, Prof. Uh, Hedal Masters has been really an extraordinary evening, and we really want to thank you for, on behalf of Lowell and Larry and myself, the Rutan branch, for giving your valuable time. Uh, for your really very insightful and your very, very special insight into uh, Aaron Applefeld that now we have a better understanding of. And uh, really, thank you very, very much. And we want to wish you a Shabbat Tov. We hope to hear from you again because you are really, you are very articulate and it's just very, it's, it's, it's very, very special hearing from you. And we really appreciate it very much. So thank you very, very much. And, and um, we hope that you'll appear again on the Root and Branch Forum. Okay. <clears throat> Lowell, if you want to add anything, or Larry? I just want to say one thing, you know, that um, I'm sure that I speak also for Les and Lowell that uh, not only did we enjoy your shiur, but we did, I take it to be a present, okay? You gave us a beautiful present, we, I loved it, beautiful feelings, and appreciation for the fact that in Israel we can talk not only about the politics, but also the beauty that surrounds us. Yeah. There's not only, black, not only black, but there's also a lot of white. Yeah. Larry, I, I agree with you. Anyway, thank you very much. I think Hilal's muted, uh, but he'll be able to watch the, the video, the, the YouTube of this. But thank you very, very much. And both to you, Larry and Lowell, thank you so much for organizing and putting this together in a very unique and special evening.